And I'm Joe Ageo. It is exactly one week to the general election on March 4th. And tonight we'll be hearing again from the eight presidential candidates on the issues that matter to you, the Kenyan voter, the economy, as well as land and natural resources. The live audience here at Brookhouse International School has agreed to remain silent. No jeering and no cheering during the debate. The only exception will be now as we welcome the candidates to the podium. The candidates are joining us in the order of a ballot carried out earlier. First to uh, uh, get onto the podium will be Professor James Olekiapi of the Restore and Build Kenya or RBK Party. Next on stage, Musalia Mudavadi of the UDF, United Democratic Forum Party. Next up is Paul Mwite of Safina. The next presidential candidate on stage, Martha Karua of NAC Kenya. The presidential flag bearer for the Orange Democratic Movement, Raila Odinga. The next candidate on stage will be Mohamed Abduba Dida of the Alliance for Real Change. Making his way into the auditorium next will be Uhuru Kenyatta of the National Alliance or TNA. Completing the list of eight, Peter Kenneth of the Kenya National Congress. Welcome back to the Kenya presidential debate, lady and gentlemen. Uh, shall we all rise for the national uh, anthem led this evening by Kabutha Mwanzia Asio?
Let's all be seated and candidates please take your positions behind your respective podiums. Well, this is the first segment uh, of the evening that is going to be on the economy and that will be driven by my co-moderator, Uduak Amemo. Thank you, Joe. Uh, as before, we've received thousands of questions from the public, but uh, ultimately the questions are our own. I haven't seen Joe's questions and he hasn't seen mine. So again, as before, you have two minutes to respond to questions and 30 seconds for rebuttals. You have a timer in front of you to uh, help you manage your time, but I'll also stop you uh, when your time is up. I'll also remind you that you've agreed to address each other respectfully and to keep your language civil. So we're dealing with the economy, and the first uh, question centers on the minimum wage. Um, I'll start with you, Professor Kiapi, in the order of entry. Um, what do you think the minimum wage in Kenya should be? <coughs> Um, minimum wage is, of course, a factor of the economic conditions of the country. It is a factor of the labor itself. And, that, and it's also a function of the employers and the, the, the negotiation between the government and the trade unions. And, and therefore, when you are saying or setting a minimum wage, you must bring all these factors into consideration. So it is not a matter about saying this is the level exactly this. It is a matter about structuring labor in the country. Because in Kenya today, you have every now and then uh, one sector of the economy demanding a wage and another sector of the economy demanding an increase. And that is pointing to a much more serious problem. And the more serious problem is that the labor is not commensurate. There are disparities. And therefore, what I would like to do when I'm president is to engage as government and employers and the trade unions to really look at a sustainable uh, manner in which we can appropriate labor in the country. So how much we will use and how much we shall set must depend on the economy at that time, the, the prevailing conditions, and it must be negotiated so that you also must ensure there is stability. Because uh, labor and rest from time to time can also be not useful and not good for economic growth. So I, I think what has been missing is a structured engagement that brings all the stakeholders together. And this is my commitment to the Kenyan people and especially the employers that our biggest capital, our, our, our number one resource is the human capital or, or the labor. But we need to make sure that that labor is properly structured and managed in order to arrive at levels Thank that you. are Your sustainable. Time is up. Your time is up. Ms. Karu, I'll come to you because Professor Kiapi touched on labor and rest. And so Kenya um, currently ranks as one of the countries that uh, has the unfortunate dis distinction of being one of the most unequal. So we have a minimum wage at about 8,000 shillings, and for some people it's 500 shillings a day. What do you think the minimum wage should be? This afternoon? Yes. I, we, all over the world, the talk now is not about minimum wage. It's about livable wage, and that is what the ILO standards demand. Therefore, it is a question of having strong labor movement, creating an enabling environment for labor movement to thrive so that they can have um, the strength to negotiate with the industry and seeing the labor movement as a partner. My government will have a partnership with the labor movement, will encourage in the industry to partner with labor. When you have livable wages for workers, Industry also benefits. Healthy workers are able to be more productive. So it's for the benefit of the country, the benefit of the economy, and wages also depend on how much the government is putting in in terms of uh, other public services. My government will give universal health care, what we are calling cradle to grave, uh, free education from nursery, primary to secondary, this again takes away the burden of uh, the cost, some of the cost of living away from the worker. So a combined effort by government, how we spend our tax money, and industry also investing a little bit more in the workers 
The industry makes profit, the workers are happy and are able to produce more. That's what I would do. Okay, thank you yeah. very much. Mr. Odinga, um, we've heard uh, um, two candidates now talk about uh, engaging with labor. Uh, we've heard uh, a livable wage um, uh, brought into the discussion. Uh, what do you think the lowest, the least, uh, uh, what is the least wage a, a Kenyan should earn? Um, given that um, uh, people in your class of leaders earn more than $10,000 a month. Well, uh, we talk of... Uh the living wage, that is a, a wage that will enable somebody to lead, live a, a decent life. And you look at the shopping basket, the cost of, of living in the country, the cost of transport, the cost of, uh, of uh, uh, the rent, uh, the, the cost of uh, things like the food and so on. So that is what it should be. Now, we, we need to have a, a dialogue, a tripartite uh, uh, arrangement where you have got the unions, the employer, and the government talking about this so that we really know what is the cost of living in the country today and what should it be. And uh, that, that is what should determine what should be the living wage, a minimum wage in the country so that there's harmony. Because you must know that for us to be able to grow we must be competitive in the international labor market. If, for example, the, the wages are too high in our economy, of course we price ourselves out of that market. So we must look at the causative factors. What is it that makes the unions demand 300% pay, pay rise? The teachers, the nurses, the doctors, the lecturers, and so on. So we need to have a dialogue to be able to determine that. I'll just uh, interrupt you there to ask you, do you not know what the cost of living is in Kenya at the moment? No, we know what it is, but it is not static. The cost of living keeps on changing. Like, for example, if the price of oil goes up, uh, it will go, go up tomorrow. The cost of transport will go up. Matatu used to cost uh, 30 shillings from Dandora into town. Today it is 50 shillings. Uh, a, 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 a packet of milk was 25 shillings. Now it is 45 uh, 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 Unga was, for example, 70, it is now 120. So we will want to we'll need dialogue so that we can agree on what really is a living wage for the worker in the country. Mr. Dida, do you have any thoughts on the minimum wage? What do you think it should be, minimum or living wage, if you will? Well, uh, due to economic inequality, is why 90% of Kenyans are marginalized economically. And uh, I'm hearing a dialogue, and the nurses are still on the road. What they need is always on posters in the road. This is my house rent, this is this, this is this. They sing this, and it had happened. Uh, what we need is to clearly explain to everybody that nobody is super Kenyan. Nobody is super whether the president or the security. It is unfair for a Kenyan to earn a gross salary, gross of 8,000, while a leader is earning, leave the salary and entertainment allowance of five, half a million. It is unfair. And it is shocking because the commission that was appointed to look into this is also, might be circumference, and nearness to the palace is one thing that is affecting most of us. Uh, my government will not accept the figures that were given, and what, what I propose is a formula. Which formula do we use as Kenyans to pay these wages? It is the formula that matters. If we will base ourselves on payment following education, is a formula, and everybody is contented. But we don't understand, I don't understand, and any, any human being does not understand why somebody should be paid two million and another one five, 5,000. So what, 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 what I will encourage and what my government will advocate is equity for everybody. Nobody is super and nobody is a nugu. We are all the same. We have the same stomach, we have the same children and everything. The, the, the leaders need is what the citizens need. Thank you very much, Mr. Dida. Mr. Kenyatta, you've been the Minister of Finance, and uh, Mr. Dida was talking about the inequalities in Kenya, uh, the salary the, uh, disparities. Um, and I'll 
take you back to 1972 when the International Labour Organization recommended uh, a salary freeze for Kenya's top uh, income earners. Um, what do you think um, is a livable wage for Kenyans and would your government um, freeze the, the salaries of its uh, top uh, income earners? I think the most important thing to recognize is that uh, the cost of, of, of um, or the minimum wage, the living cost, is not something that you can say is a fixed cost because it depends on overall the cost of living. What we need to ensure is that we have a wage that ensures that people have a decent living, but at the same time, a minimum wage that ensures that also as a nation, we remain competitive. And that is why we, in the Jubilee Coalition, are actually focusing not just on the, on the wage bill itself, but to actually just say that we need to really focus ourselves, especially when it comes to agriculture, reducing the cost of agriculture, making food much more affordable, looking at housing, how can we make the cost of building our houses that much cheaper so that the rents can come down. Because at the end of the day, that wage is supposed to ensure that every individual in Kenya who is employed has a decent life. That can only come once we ensure that we also are maintaining the prices of our foodstuffs, telecommunications, and so on and so forth, at a level where we don't have to consistently push the wage bill up in order to allow people to survive. That said and done, we must also recognize that as politicians and as leaders, we do have a moral responsibility as well to ensure that these kind of heavy salary increases that we consistently give ourselves as politicians don't actually happen. I want to remind Kenyans that uh, when I was, during my tenure as uh, the, the Minister of Finance, I was under intense pressure from um, members of Parliament on this issue of increasing salaries. And in fact, our finance bill was very late because I actually rejected that. And I told them that it's actually not possible for us to be able to award ourselves these huge increases while at the same time expecting the average Your Kenyan to live on the kind of salary wage he up. has. Um, uh, Mr. Kenneth, we've heard about uh, uh, the huge wage bill um, in uh, Kenya at the moment, which I believe uh, in, for, for the uh, um, leadership, the government wage bill is 8% of our GDP. Um, uh, our leadership size is also comparable to uh, the U.S., although their population is 10 times more than ours. So how would you address this income disparity uh, in Kenya? I think, first of all, with the Constitution, we need to implement the issues to do with salaries and remuneration commission so that we can have basic standards within government officers, and this would be across the board. I am happy that they have seen it twice to reduce, and they should be encouraged to reduce further so that we can save uh, the government from such a huge wage bill that needs to go to basic services. When we talk about cost of living, cost of living is one up because basic services are not there. So if you get your 8,000 shillings, you still have to cater for yourself from a medical point. The transport system is not there. You have to secure yourself. And sometimes then you find that you have been left with nothing to take home. Now, in assessing what the minimum wage bill should be, it is important to review what the rate of inflation is. It is also important to cushion Kenyans against factors that are external. We need to think of how we can cushion Kenyans against, for example, when oil goes up, our food prices go up. We need to cushion Kenyans when the dollar goes up, appreciates against the shilling. Then, because we are a net importer, we are left with no choice but to increase. And I sympathize with the ordinary worker because they are really suffering. But we also need to expand our economy to create opportunities because at the moment also our workers have been reduced to compete for fewer opportunities in the market and therefore the issue of the minimum wage bill becomes more or less compulsory but if they had opportunities they would be in a position to venture into other areas of employment within opportunities that have been created within the labor market. Thank you Mr. Kenneth. Mr. Mwiti, I'll come to you because um, so far from the candidates we haven't really heard any specifics about uh, what the lowest a Kenyan should be, uh, you, what the lowest uh, salary um, should be for a Kenyan. Yet we all know what Kenya's top income earners make, uh, those of you in leadership. So can you tell us what you think 
uh, the least uh, a Kenyan should earn is? First of all, let's look at uh, the statistics. The World Bank places Kenya at number 171. Only 27 nations are behind Kenya in terms of poverty, measured on the basis of the GDP. We're talking about a country, Kenya, where the GDP is 286 US dollars per annum, works out at 24,000 shillings per year. We're talking about a situation if we are to divide, distribute our wealth equally, each Kenyan would be getting 2,000 shillings per month. Works out at about 66 shillings per day. The cost of 2 kg portion meal, unga, which is why they talk about the unga revolution, is 140 shillings. So these are the statistics that we should be looking at. What is the rationale when you are fixing the minimum age? It should be a wage that is able to give a Kenyan a decent living. But where is it going to come from? I see a disconnect, for example, between taxation policies, particularly with regard to small-scale businesses and medium-scale businesses. Because as we tax businesses, we need to nurture those businesses so that they can produce more, so that what you are taxing them can be more. Because there is a limit to what the businesses can afford. I mean, when you talk about the minimum wage, the lowest paid are domestic workers and agricultural workers. And yet, what they are paid is not enough to give them a decent living. On the other hand, there are constraints on the employers. So we need to harmonize, we need to rationalize. The bottom line is that we must make our economy grow. We must come up with policies that nurture businesses. We Your must aim to export Thank you. more than we import. Your time is up. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mudavadi, I'll come to you. Um, because we're hearing about addressing uh, the, uh, the economic system, providing social services, uh, making sure that, uh, you, you know, reducing the burdens on the average Kenyan worker. Do you think, you know, perhaps that there should be a minimum wage or not? Um, and we've also heard uh, two of your rivals talk about uh, um, the minimizing the wage bill. But the question flowing from all of this is the cost of our leadership. If we talk about where the money for a minimum wage will come from, surely it will come from you know, the leadership and reducing the costs that uh, you and your colleagues are uh, incurring on our behalf. Yeah, I would like to make uh, one observation, and this is that clearly Kenya does not have a good wage policy. We have not reviewed our wage policy on a serious note for a very long time. Uh, we have lived with what we more or less had at the very beginning, and it has not been reviewed, bearing in mind that now we have a more open, a more market-oriented economy. So this is one thing that I would immediately uh, pull all the stakeholders together so that we can review appropriately the wage policy. The second point I would just want to point out uh, is that clearly the 8,000 shillings is not sustainable in the long run. Right now, every Kenyan, particularly the poor Kenyan, spends up to about 70% of their resources on food alone. Not shelter yet, not on other items yet, but just food alone. Now, clearly, if we want uh, to help the Kenyan people and make them have a truly living wage, then we must institute certain measures. We must make sure that agriculture can expand so that food can be cheaper. We must tackle aspects of energy production uh, because these are matters that go into uh, a lot of production and that would help in easing the cost of production and as a consequence be able to help Kenyans meet uh, their daily uh, lives. One other thing that is serious is the cost of fuel. I've talked of uh, electricity but the cost of fuel is so prohibitive. Uh, right now the common man spends almost 100 shillings a litre on kerosene which they use for cooking. Now, we have heard people talking about reducing overall uh, rates 
of fuel in other areas. But if you target a blanket aspect, you'll not be helping the poor. So one of the things that I would really do is to continuously focus on areas of mitigating against the pressure that the poor okay, are Okay, your time is up. So just a quick follow-up. Would you recommend, would you, would you uh, freeze the salaries of the top 10 percent as the ILO recommended in 1972? I think we have to bear in mind that, that we have to bear in mind that 1972 is way back. But with a clear wage policy, we can rationalise the growth and the situation of Kenyan salary levels at this point in time. The remuneration uh, commission is a good step in the right is a step in the right direction. But we must work quickly and have this policy adopted and even endorsed by Parliament as soon as possible, so that we can now move and remove the distortions in our economy. Okay, Ms. Karua, would you uh, freeze the, the salaries of the top 10%? I think it's no longer necessary because we have an organ at Constitutional Commission to do that. Not literally freeze, but harmonize the wages. I would give them full support, give them all the necessary backup they need from the civil service and from um, my government to ensure that they do their work within a reasonable time. I would also make other interventions that help to lessen the cost of living. I've already mentioned about health services and Your education. Okay. But also Your time is up. Your time is up. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kenyatta, I asked you the question about uh, the uh, income freeze first. And since 1972, when that uh, um, policy was recommended, the inequalities, the disparities in Kenya have grown significantly. Would you um, recommend a freeze for the top uh, income earners? I, I, I think I would recommend uh, a, a freeze. And it's, it's not necessarily a freeze. But we have to recognize that um, if we are to retain sanity in our um, financial management, especially as a government. We have to ensure that our public officers are paid a reasonable wage, but not a wage that at the end of the day pushes other salaries up because we have awarded our salaries that are not in line with any principle. It's just a question of Thank sitting you. in Parliament and agreeing. Thank you. Mr. Kenneth? I think we need to be sensitive. We need to actually look at the higher perks that people earn and also we need to think of how to bridge the gap. And for me, we need to create choices so that workers are not left with no choices. And the only way to deal with this is to give incentives to the economy to grow so that workers can have the choice of selecting so where no they would like to you. go. Yes. No freeze from you. Uh, Mr. Dida, what do you think? I will, my government will recommend not only a freeze but an overpayment. They have to pay it back. <laughs> yeah. Because that injustice, why these commissions and why the new constitution is to be implemented is just to come up with a healing process. And uh, some of us have very huge debt, and this has to be. The only way is they pay it back. Okay, back pay. Uh, Mr. Kiapi. <laughs> I will do three things. Number one, let us make sure that it's equity by rationalizing salaries from the top and the bottom. Number two, we need to bake a bigger cake. It doesn't matter how much we argue. If it is the same, we will fight each other for nothing. Number three, let us make sure payment is based on productivity. If you do more, then we pay you more. Unlike now, where parliamentarians sit for one hour and you pay them 800000 and teachers are teaching for Your time eight is hours. Up. Yes. Uh, Mr. Muite, would you free salaries? Uh, Safina government uh, would be sensitive to the outcry of the Kenyan people in terms of the salaries and allowances earned, for example, by members of parliament, uh, ministers, uh, PAs, and what have you, and therefore would make a very strong recommendation to the Salaries and Remuneration Commission uh, to take those sensitivities into account and bring them down. Kenya is one of the most unequal nations on the earth and a good Your starting time is up. point. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Odinga, would you freeze salaries of the top income earners in Kenya? For this economy to grow, we must reduce consumption. At the moment, the recurrent expenditure is just too high. You're just consuming. We will actually recommend not just a freeze, but reduction. And I will begin with myself. I will have the pay of the president 
so that I can, I can lead by example. You will help others today. follow suit. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next set of questions. And these have to do with your uh, personal economies because you've all talked about addressing corruption. Uh, sorry, we're moving on. Uh, we are addressing corruption now. You've uh, all uh, talked about it. And so I'm going to ask you about your records because uh, some of you, those of you who've been in public service for some time, are associated uh, with certain uh, events in our history which... Uh, have uh, been thrown up um, in your quest for leadership. And so, Mr. Mwite, I'll start with you. Sure. Because uh, in the 90s, uh, Kamlesh Patni alleged that he gave you a bribe of 20 million shillings. Um, you told Parliament in April 1999 that you'd responded to the Law Society of Kenya on that matter. Can you please tell us um, what exactly took place, whether you accepted a bribe of 20 million shillings from Kamlesh Patni? It is absolutely not true. I mean, what was happening in the 90s is that I and Professor Nyang Nyongo we are the ones who broke out this issue of golden bar. The system then focused on me. And let me tell you, some of us have had to pay very high prices. At the personal level, it was a well-orchestrated campaign to silence me on the issue of golden bar. You will remember the Commission of Inquiry by Bosire, despite whatever other shortcomings it may have had, their report was there, and Mr. Muite wasn't uh, mentioned. There is no truth in it. It may be possible that some individuals around me may have gone and gotten money from him on the basis that he was going to intervene, they were going to intervene. It isn't true. In fact, shortly after the time he says that he gave me that money. I was the lead counsel on behalf of the Law Society in mounting a private prosecution in the Golden Bug matter. So there isn't an iota of Let's truth. To that. Let me that just follow up on that because yes. um, if I remember correctly, the Law Society then said they found that um, you or persons associated to you um, had accepted a check of 15 million uh, shillings and cash in 5 million shillings. So for purposes of clarity, um, because we know um, what a drain corruption has been on this country, could you please clarify that for us? That is what I said earlier. Individuals around me may have gotten money. Mr. Moita did not get any money whatsoever. And in fact, Mr. Patney himself eventually accepted that he never gave me any money at all. And that is on record in the Bosire Judicial Commission of Nicaragua. Okay. Thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, Mr. Mudavadi, you're also linked to Goldenberg, and more recently in 2010 to a cemetery uh, land scandal. Um, you've been investigated in the case of uh, uh, the cemetery land scandal by Parliament. Um, could you just uh, clarify uh, these uh, scandals and your role in them um, for us? Let me start with the Goldenberg uh, issue. The Goldenberg issue is an export compensation scheme and a pre-shipment scheme that was abused. And I was appointed to the Treasury in 1993 when the Golden Buck scheme was in force. So what did I do? I terminated it. And what were the steps that I took to terminate Golden Bug? First, I got Pricewaterhouse to set up a special audit on the transactions surrounding Golden Bug, which they did. Consequent to that, my time in Treasury, I was able to close several banks that were associated with the abuse of the pre-shipment and pre-export uh, uh, scheme. I got this out of the way. Many banks had to close. Uh, we even changed the law regarding the central bank vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the question of what central bank can do and what it cannot do. The law was changed during my tenure, and this was to close the whole chapter of Golden Bag. I was subsequently also exonerated by the Bosira Commission, which was a public inquiry that went on for three years. Now, the second issue is the issue about the cemetery. This is a procurement issue at the City Council of Nairobi. They did not follow the procedure. They failed to follow the laid down procedure. And the matter was investigated. I personally wrote to the um, anti-corruption authority and I said this matter should be investigated. They did investigate. I was interrogated. They interrogated many other people. And after their findings, they took the matter to court. And that is where the matter rests now. 
Right. Uh, thank you very much for that. I just want to be clear. Um, two parliamentary commissions investigated you, if I'm not mistaken, and one found you culpable and another cleared you. Could you just address the um, uh, parliamentary investigations? I, first of all, let's agree that Parliament has an oversight role. They did uh, their investigations, but I want to state very clearly that I was not culpable and I stood my ground and I attended the sessions of both of those committees and I maintain very clearly that I was not involved in any malpractice. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Perua, I'll come to you because you say you're committed to the rule of law and to tackling corruption and impunity. Um, I will then question your treatment of whistleblowers in this country because, of course, they have been the ones who've alerted us to corruption in the country. Yeah. Um, yet you, as Minister of Justice, have not... Uh, put out any support for, say, John Githongo, uh, David Munyake, or Naftali Langat? May I say that I became Minister of Justice December 2005. If you remember, John Githongo announced he had left the country January of that year. So he was not around the country to demand or look for any protection. Munyake was earlier than I was Minister for Justice, and... Um, what I did during my time, the only witnesses who came to me were witnesses related to the Charter House Bank. I gave them full support within the ambit of the law at that time, and some of them eventually left the country. And even when their issues have come in Parliament, when they were being called names, I was the sole voice saying we should not tra trash whistleblowers. Okay. Um, I'll... I'll Zero in on David Munyake because we know that uh, unfortunately he died a couple of years ago. Have you um, or did you, while you were Minister of Justice, uh, make any sort of overtures to his family? Um, have you made any sort of overtures to John Gidongo? Because I remember correctly, uh, if I remember correctly, you and your then Foreign Affairs counterpart, uh, Rafael Tuju, and a couple of ministers held a press conference denouncing John Gidongo when he went into exile, fearing for his life over Anglo Gold, uh, Anglo leasing? I do not think that there was a joint press conference denouncing him, maybe defending the government's position, because what had happened was that the Anglo leasing scandal came out. We did, as Minister of Justice, I printed in the newspapers the whole history of Anglo leasing, who was minister when, and also admitting that it did come up during our time. And it was during my tenure that the anti-corruption law, together with the <coughs> Public Officers Ethics Act, for the first time did what it was supposed to do. On my recommendation, ministers stepped aside. Never mind that they never forgave me for having them step aside. And I have consistently pursued that line. But in terms of looking after the actual whistleblowers themselves, you've never taken a personal interest in their... In the sense that there was... I've taken personal interest when they have come to me, like the Chatterhouse Bank uh, witnesses did. But for those who were abroad, honestly, how would I look David after Munyake them? David was not abroad. David was Munyake, his matter was an old matter. And there was no scheme to support what he needed because he came to my office once when I was Minister for Justice. He needed support, financial support. My office did not have any such. Okay, whatever. thank you very much. Yeah. Time is up. Yeah. Um, Mr. Odinga, um, you've been in public service for a while, and so you are associated with several uh, uh, scandals. Um, we have the Urban Food Subsidy Program. There's the Kazi Kwavijana. Um, so a whole raft of uh, ambitious programs originating from the office of the Prime Minister that uh, have unfortunate ends. Could you please clarify this for the sake of our viewers? Well, um, the Kazi Kwavijana project was basically a project that we conceived in very good faith to try to cushion the youth at a time when the economy was really very bad. It was intended to put money into the pocket of the youth at that time through projects like road construction, construction of dams and water pans, clearing of drainages, and so on. My office was merely coordinating because it was being executed by line ministries, six ministries to, uh, to be exact. And um, it, it, uh, it, it was executed 
and to the end in that financial year, and about 300,000 jobs were created for the youth. But it was also a good lesson for us that um, bureaucracy can actually frustrate something that is very noble, uh, because um, when it was audited, when we got information that there had been some uh, indiscretion, we asked the Treasury to carry out an audit. This audit was carried out, and uh, it was found out that there had been some double procurement in some ministries. Mm -hmm. please, please carry on, but just uh, watch your time. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, uh, the uh, action was actually taken against the officers who were found to have been culpable. The World Bank also did an audit of this particular pro uh, program. And the World Bank actually eventually gave it a clean bill of health. Uh, and decided to continue with a component of it, which is right now being rolled out by the private sector. So it was actually a, a stimulus uh, program aimed at cushioning the youth at the time when the economy was very bad. There was the drought, we had a post-election violence, and there was a world economic meltdown. And that's the reason why we introduced it. it we have learned a lot of lessons okay, from so it. Okay, so your time is up. I'll follow up. Uh, 30 seconds. The urban food subsidy program, which turned into the maize scandal. Could you clarify that, please? The maize scandal, the, when we got information that there had been some indiscretion, I asked the officers who have been mentioned in my office, the permanent secretary and the, the, uh, the chief of staff to step down for investigations. I also suspended two ministers, but as you know that my, my action was countermanded. What I said was that these officers were investigated and were only brought back after independent investigations were concluded. Your time is up, but I will follow up because we see different treatment of ministers from you, double standards, so that uh, you suspended ministers when it came to the May scandal, but we've had a, um, recent controversies within the health ministry and no minister um, has been suspended. How do you justify that? There has really been no concrete evidence provided to show that there's been any kind of uh, wrongdoing in the ministry financially. There's, there have just been wild allegations and claims. If I had had any concrete evidence that there was any indiscretion, I would not hesitate to suspend the minister and the permanent secretary. But this has not been the case. Okay. Ms. Karua, you want to uh, say something? I just wanted to remind um, the Honorable Prime Minister that one gets suspended, not because there is concrete evidence against you, to facilitate investigations. And therefore, in the case of the NHIF scandal, there was concrete evidence of irregular payments to health service providers. You, you remember that the CEO of, of uh, the, the, the ministry himself was actually suspended in that particular case, and even the board was also suspended. But and not the, the minister. The, not the minister, because the minister, there was no evidence linking the minister to what had happened in that particular corporation. If there had been, I would not have hesitated to suspend the minister to facilitate investigations. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Mr. Dida, I'll come to you. Um, again, personal economies, because you've told us, um, or you've told the media, that you have an employment agency that sends uh, workers to the Middle East. Is that correct? It is uh, an agency that it was meant to save the plights of Kenya by sourcing employment. Right. Um, so I'll ask you the, the substantive question. As president, you're expected to create jobs in Kenya, um, but you have a personal business that uh, outsources Kenyan labor, takes them to the Middle East where they work, you know, presumably as domestics. And we've all seen, um, you know, uh, the images of, uh, you know, uh, people and the way they're treated in the Middle East. Is this correct? Is this right? Kenya is very rich in human resource and the world is in need of this gift that God has blessed with Kenya. But one thing that failed the system, it is not, uh, uh, employment was not sourced only in the Middle East. We have, in the country, we have 57 employment agencies who source for employment all over the five continents. But uh, all of us were frustrated because the country lacks legal infrastructure. It is the state 
It is the government that is to, to agree, have a memorandum of understanding with the other government on what a Kenyan should be paid, how the children, what, what will be the fate of the children, what will be the housing, medical, all this. So it was us following our problems. We didn't, we, I worked for the government and had to leave because of funny salaries and because of very funny working conditions. Then when we came up with this idea, go to the Ministry of Labor, my returns, every four months reach zero, zero, zero. When we went using our money and came back to report that things are hostile outside, we were told a commission will be formed, it will investigate, we are waiting. We are waiting up to this minute. Okay, with respect, Mr. Dida, you haven't quite ad addressed my substantive question. Is it right for you as a president to be uh, sending Kenyans abroad to work as domestics? Should you not be concentrating on creating jobs we, and strengthening the environment here? We have to take advantage on any system or any opportunity that will save our current condition. With it, in the country and outside the country, whichever avenue. And every year, the government makes billions of money following the Kenyans who sneaked out of this country. And when this was severely repeated, that it is not safe to work outside, it is not safe to work outside. As we speak, Kenyans Your are going. As up. we speak, they are Your going. Your time is up. Um, Mr. Kenyatta, uh, a few years ago, uh, there was a clerical or typing error, the newspapers report this in the quotes, that resulted in uh, millions of shillings uh, being lost um, within the budget that you presented to Parliament. Could you explain that? Let me first begin by saying that uh, there was no money lost. And even as the media has reported it, as you've correctly stated, it was an error. We uh, acknowledged that particular error. The matter was investigated by both the Parliamentary Committee, the IMF, and also the Office of the Auditor General. And it was found to be precisely that, an error. I have never been accused of any kind of financial uh, impropriety. And furthermore, as a result of that error, I did even, in fact take action of um, overseeing the re-engineering of the integrated financial management information system to include a budget module so that that error would not be repeated again in the future. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Kiyapi, uh, just this weekend in the newspapers, um, a court order um, directing you to pay over 700 million shillings to a supplier because his contract was uh, improperly uh, terminated. Could you address that, please? Yes. Um, when I went to the Ministry of Medical Services in September 2008, I found that my predecessor had signed that contract with a company called Dole International. And when I arrived, there was already investigation by the Anti-Corruption Commission because it was alleged that the procurement was, did not follow the law. So basically, as a new PS, I was briefed by the, the ministry officials that I could not approve that payment pending this investigation. And I was also equally advised by the Anti-Corruption Commission that it would be imprudent. So that's what I did. I basically said, let the investigation take uh, their own course. And in the end, we went to the Public Accounts Committee and I gave again the same submission. The, the issue was not me approving money, which I was not confident of. The issue was to be sure that the government or the public resources were spent correctly. And that was my role. In fact, if anything, I protected public resources. And I must be commended for that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kenneth, there are questions about uh, your wealth, um, in spite of the fact that you're the only MP who's paid taxes. Um, and these questions stem from your uh, previous life um, in uh, private service. Uh, uh, um, could you address that, please? Well, I only served in two places in public places. One was the Kenya Football Federation. I was the national chairman. We had no funding from government at all. And the entire funding was coming from three corporate sponsors, Kenya Breweries, BAT, and Smith Klein Beachams, and their own officers were signatories of any money spent for KFF together with our Secretary General. And when I left, we left an audited account and 11 million shillings in the bank. Second time I served as in, a pub, in a public office was at Kenyari, Kenyari Insurance Corporation as Managing Director. All I did was to prepare the company to be stock listed. And today, 
is one of the best quoted companies in the stock exchange. Okay, thank you very thank you. much. So very quickly, yes, Mr. Kiapi. Yudwak, I want to, to, af- to ask a question to, to the office of the Prime Minister. Yes, go ahead, and, please. And the Deputy Prime Minister, who was then Minister for Finance. Go, go, go ahead. When I went to the Ministry of Education, I was alleged to have presided over the laws of free primary education when it was obvious that I had just left the Ministry of Medical Services. And even though I tried to bring out to the public domain that I was just a new PS and the reason I went there was actually to go and sort out the mess. Your question, please. The, the two officers, yeah, you know, why did they fail to bring this matter to conclusion up to this point to explain to the country what exactly happened, whether or not that money was lost? Uh, Mr. Kenyatta, I'll start with you. That matter was uh, investigated. And, in fact, it did reveal that a number of officers at the Ministry of Education were involved in um, irregular uh, activities. There was also an issue on the other side of certain expenses that were not part of the program, but you could not necessarily tie impropriety to them. The report was completed and finalized even before I left the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Finance. Right. Uh, Mr. Odenga, a chance to respond because... uh, you well, also to, ask the question? To my knowledge, some officers in the Ministry of Education were actually prosecuted, and some of them actually sentenced to serve prison terms. So I'm very surprised that my brother is saying none of the officers was found to have been uh, uh, implicated. Uh, I did suspend the minister at that time because of some remarks he had made somewhere saying that he was rewarding people from his constituency uh, with this, this money. So I'm, I'm saying we need to be able to take action when right. we find in this Your situation. time is up. Mr. Dida? Good work. The policy, it's, sorry, the I'll policy give Mr. generally before. was if you can't beat this government and the corruption system and the cartels, you join them. That is why those who never liked it, they, there was no option. They, Kamle Shpatni, you mentioned, is a young man who confused everybody in this government. And he said, jail me, but we will go, all of us, from the retired to the current in the system. Okay, your time is up. Mr. Kiapi. I I just wanted to clarify that there were two issues. There was an earlier inquiry which forced the peers to be asked to step aside and which necessitated the extended forensic audit. And therefore, the one where officers were interdicted was the first one. This second one involved 4.2 billion Kenya shillings, and later on it turned out that 2.3 billion Kenya shillings was just a reconciliation issue, and 1.9 billion shillings actually went to primary schools, and that's the one where I was being crucified. Okay. Mr. Kenyatta, back to you. Like I said, uh, the issue was two parts. One, that uh, we were able to prove actual uh, impropriety, and action was taken against those officers. As uh, Mr. Kiapi has said, there was also the issue of um, payments made that were not necessarily uh, um, um, improper, but were irregular in accordance with the program. Then there was also the issue of reconciliation. That whole scenario was finished. I think what um, Honorable Kiapi is talking about is that uh, maybe Your time is there up. was no public statement to okay. say that, uh, to that it was not found to be culpable. Right. Your, your time is up. Uh, Mr. Odinga. No, I, I, should, I, I, I sympathize with him that um, this uh, happened, um, but he did not bring this to the notice of the office of the Prime Minister that was having these sort of problems. I would have actually uh, this, uh, ordered that his name be cleared. He did not. He's just raising it here uh, now. All the times whenever I hear these kind of things, I take quick action. Right. Thank you very much. Mr. Mwite. Um, out of the 10 billion shillings, the budget error, you will trace 8 billion is actually in the Ministry of Education. Second point, perhaps calling for comment, is that why we say that no money was lost in the Ministry of Education. The British government demanded a refund of money that had been misappropriated. And we refunded from taxpayers' money. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, Ms. Caro. I, I just thought that uh, we, certain issues have not been raised. For my colleague, Honorable Mudavadi, the, his role in one of the Anglo 
leasing contracts. And for my colleague, Honorable Odinga, the issue of the molasses land. And for my friend, esteemed friend Peter Kenneth, the circumstances under which he came to own a house that belonged to Kenya Re. These are all in the public Thank domain. Thank you. That's how um, I know so, them. So, Mr. Mudavadi, um, uh, Ms. Karua has uh, raised a point uh, on Anglo leasing. I want to state that um, clearly I have not been involved in any impropriety uh, in uh, government. And I want to state here that the issue that she's raising, which uh, had to do with um, the telecommunications area, was a matter that was investigated and has been investigated. And this happened uh, way back almost 10 years ago. And to date, um, I have answered all the questions that I have been asked regarding this particular issue. And I feel that I have been vindicated because Your time is up, up to date, You've been I, I have not been charged for anything. Mr. Odinga, um, the molasses uh, saga. Well, the molasses uh, project was a, a project turned sour, a government corporation uh, with a, a foreign company. It was then decided to be sold. It was put under receivership through uh, Price, what, uh, I mean, NS Young. It was sold through an auction by a company. Specs International bought it through an auction, and full price was paid for the plant, including that of land. So there was no corruption in that. Thank you. Mr. Kenneth? I never bought any house from Kenya Insurance Corporation. I went to the PIC to actually give evidence as a friendly witness of a house that I bought that had been bought by somebody else from Kenya National Assurance. And I'm glad that Central Bank gave evidence to show that even the first buyer fully paid in his transaction with Kenya National. And those details are with Parliament. Thank you. Uh, so these questions all relate to uh, the leadership and integrity. Y yes, Mr. Kenneth. Yes, I had a, I had a question, but yes. you didn't notice my okay. hand. Okay, please go and ahead. And this goes to my friend, Honorable Mudavadi, right. and probably Honorable Moita because he was in that committee. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this because if my friend, Professor Saitoti, was alive, the details on especially Goldenberg would have been different. I just want to know, the two big entries that constituted... Goldenberg, that is the 5.9 and the 13.5, were paid in 1993, in April and August 1993, okay. under your tenure. Under what circumstances? Because I think it's good for clarity as we try to reconcile ourselves with these things. Uh, Mr. Mudavadi. I think it's uh, a situation where I'm being brought to talk about a situation where somebody is not available to defend themselves. But let me put it very clearly. Uh, and let uh, God rest Professor Itoji's soul in internal peace. But let me put it very clearly. When I took over in the Golden Bag, uh, I mean in the Ministry of Finance, the Golden Bag scandal had already uh, been identified. However, the details of it had not been done. And the transaction that he's talking about is the subject of a court case where the then permanent secretary, again deceased, uh, Dr. Koinange, um, there was somebody else within the central that. bank mm -hmm. who are involved in that transaction. That matter is in court, and I am a state witness on that particular matter. Thank you. Mr. Mwite? Well, I am even today the lawyer for Nazio Ibrahim Malish, the person to whom uh, the bulk of the gold which we don't produce is supposed to have been exported. I can state confidently that no gold was ever exported. The compensation that was being paid was being paid for goods, gold, in fact, even diamonds are supposed to have been being exported. And it was all paperwork, stamped, being stamped, with nothing going. Happily, this is not a chapter which is closed. I have the information, Nazir Ibrahim has the information, and I'm sure that one day, those who took gold and bag money we will pay it back. And finally, when you look at the figures, and yes, God rest uh, the soul of Saitoti in peace, but actually less in terms of amount was exported or rather was defrauded 
when he was Minister of Finance than when my friend Modavadi was actually Minister for Finance. Okay. About 75% was stolen when he was Minister. Right. Mr. Finance. Odinga, you had your hand up. I respond up? to that? Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I don't think uh, Honorable Paul Mwite knows what he's talking about. Because I have stated here that there was a Price Waterhouse audit report that was produced. Secondly, it's on record as in Hansard that in Parliament I stopped further payments which had been recommended by the Public Accounts Committee that further payments be pay made to Goldenberg. And I singly came out, moved a motion that blocked that payment of any further funds to Goldenberg. So I am very, very clear, and I stand here with a clean conscience, that uh, I am the one who terminated Goldenberg, which had caused havoc to the economy of this country. Mr. Odinga. In 1997, we in the opposition then insisted that uh, the women would be allowed to appoint electoral commissioners so that we can have an electoral commission that is truly independent. At that time, my sister Martha Karua was with us. As Minister for Justice and Constitutional Affairs, we again demanded that when the terms of other commissioners expire, we be allowed also to appoint other commissioners. Her response was that, oh, that was a gentleman's agreement, IPPG gentleman's agreement, allowed the executive to single-handedly source the commissioner to the electoral commission who were responsible for messing up the elections last time. That is a responsibility that she actually must uh, carry and actually she owes an explanation to the nation of Kenya. Thank you. Ms. Thank you very much for asking, uh, for raising that issue. It is true that uh, in IPPG we had agreed during that time that the opposition shares appointments of the electoral commission. That sharing was to political parties. In 2007, parties had metamorphosed in Parliament were not recognizable. Mr. Onding was part of the NAC, original NAC. So they were basically members of the party in government, but they'd broken away to the Orange Democratic Movement, born out of the referendum. So in a nutshell, there were no parties to consult except Kanu, and Kanu, mandated by the president, I consulted Kanu through its then leader, Uhuru Kenyatta. But for the other parties, because we didn't have anybody to consult, we consulted members of parliament of each of the areas where we were appointing new commissioners. And I remember consulting with members from Nyanza and even talking to Honorable Raila at the back there in parliament when I told them they could not just be given two because he was asking me whether they could get two commissioners because there was no party to give. So we consulted, and it's me personally, who consulted members of parliament virtually from each area. And that is why up to date, even if you look up through the newspapers, none of the commissioners is condemned by the members of their area because they had consented to their appointments. Mr. Odinga. I just want to jog the memory of my sister. NAC was a coalition. NAC was not a political party with individual membership. We were there, for example, like LDP. The, the, my sister belonged to the Democratic Party. There was Ford Kenya. There were several other parties in the NAC coalition. And we were there as members of the Liberal Democratic Party, which was a partner of the National Alliance Party of Kenya. She refused to recognize deliberately. She says not that the party did not exist. LDP existed, but she refused and just said the executive has the sole authority under the constitution to appoint the electoral commission. So we were the player appointing the referee, and that is actually what ended up with the, the kind of mess that we ended up with in the, in the country. Just very briefly to say, the record is there for everybody to see. LDP did not have members in Parliament. Those are the parties that came together. Even DP had no members. We all became members of NAC. It is only in 2007, where through an amendment to the Political Parties Act, we've been able to call ourselves NAC Kenya while we entered through PNU. That arrangement was not there in 2001. And blaming the Electoral Commission for the mess when it is parties and their henchmen who rigged is trying to rewrite history. 
thank you. Mr. Dida. Thank you for your sincerity pertaining your questions uh, on integrity and leadership. But did you expect a thief to tell you I've stolen? <laughs> <laughs> and number two, pertaining uh, the Electoral Commission and the mess. If things did not go right and the elections were rigged, was it wise for the honorable member, the Prime Minister, to accept the results and sign? If you are not happy, you involve the international, the UN, and it is the best, the best way of, of doing it. When all that has happened, and then he accepts to partner with that government that he claims to have stolen, is he not, is he not guilty to bear everything that has happened? Mr. Odingo? Well, uh, my brother lives in Kenya. I don't know whether he's just come in. You need to know that uh, there was an, an intermediation by the international community which ended up with signing of an accord uh, to end the violence which was going on in the country. But uh, it needs to be also put on record here that we did not go to the court because the judiciary was very partisan. All those judges had been appointed by one of the players. The chief justice was all the times robbed, ready to go and swear in the, 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 the president. So we could did the best that we could do in the interest of peace in the country to compromise and agree to sign an accord that facilitated power sharing and made the country move, move forward. Mr. Dida. The idea by Kofi Annan was just a suggestion. Is it wise you agree and you sign, you, be, you are part of the government. A wise thing was, how do you accept? Where will peace come from? The dead is not, are not yet buried. There are so many people who are displaced. And you are not, up to today, you, you, people just say it was stolen. The, the wise thing was, I will not accept these results. It has to be redone, and the international world has to be, I'm a Kenyan, I was born here. Would you I like just to respond? A the conditions for a repeat of elections did not exist at that time. There was a complete turmoil all over the country. So what we did was really in the best interest of the country, to sign for peace and move forward. This is what we, have, uh, we did so that we can, uh, could actually unite the country and uh, uh, move, uh, hold on until the next elections. So Thank we you. acted in the best interest of Kenya. Thank you. Mr. Mudavadi. <laughs> Fine. I just wanted to point out one thing, but really I wanted to revert a little bit uh, to the earlier uh, debates, because it would be important for Paul Mwite, for instance, to also elaborate a little bit about the Tigiri Ridge investment, which caused a lot of stress within the National Bank uh, of Kenya. I don't know whether he's resolved that. And uh, I would like to know whether Peter Kenneth uh, can tell us what his interest in prudential uh, building society was and uh, whether he's happy that uh, it went down with a lot of depositors' money? I was never an employee of Prudential Bank. You have to get your facts right, uh, DPM. I was an employee of Prudential Bank, which was totally different from Prudential Building Society. I was not a director. I was not a shareholder. I have read that the shareholders and directors of Prudential Bank have been taken to court by Deposit Protection Fund. Mr. Mwite. Um, it's part of the targeting that I was mentioning by a government in which you was a prominent member. You are targeting you at personal level, you are economic base, you are reputation, kila kitu. But being a lawyer, I am facing it. I have faced it. And uh, you will hear resolution, Honorable Mudavadi. But permit me to mention separately that I had hoped the Prime Minister, in, 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 apart from raising the issue of the Electoral Commission perhaps would have given an opportunity to Honorable Mother Karua to comment on the blockage of a reform package that I had initiated as chair of the Committee on the Administration of Justice and very supported very ably by the Prime Minister, the Honorable Uhuru Kenyatta, and other leaders, I discussed it with them. Because having lost the referendum in 05, it was quite clear to us that the 07 elections were going to be problematic 
without a minimum reform package targeted at making the elections uh, free and fair. Okay. Um, and as Minister for Justice, what the, role did she play Karoy, in blocking that package? Thank you. I think the word blockage should be used for them because I started as Justice Minister, a out sectoral forum that brought in all the political play players, parties inside and outside parliament to discuss the way forward. We were actually ready to complete the constitutional review process, but Moite, Honorable Moite chairing the parliamentary committee and ganging up with those who had left government quickly uh, punctured that effort and brought in his own package, which he wanted us to take as a medical prescription without discussion. It wasn't possible. Even a government has a voice, and that, that way it was completely impossible to have to complete the constitutional review process or to have his package because his package was a must, not negotiable. So, Thank you. Mr. Kenyatta, your name through. was mentioned. Mm. Mr. Mwite mentioned yeah. you as part of the uh, 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 effort to block um, his uh, reform package. I don't think uh, he said I was part of any attempt to block... Uh, he said support. He was, oh, support. he was supporting. I had breakfast with okay. him in his arms. All right. My he mistake. He was supporting. <laughs> My mistake, Mr. Kenneth. Yes. For a couple of minutes, the debate was basically between Dida, the Prime Minister, and Martha yeah. about the events of 2008. Yeah. And I would just like to ask, did it have to take us 60 days? Lots of loss of property loss of life, people getting displaced, and then eventually on the 28th of February come to a conclusion and agree. Did it have to take that long? Couldn't we have looked for faster, easier methods to arbitrate if there was a dispute? And although yesterday we were at Uhuru Park and we pledged our peace and everything, I hope come next Monday we will not have a repeat because it's a huge loss to our country and our people. It's not acceptable to go that route. That certainly is the hope of uh, every Kenyan, I believe, for peaceful elections and that you will all, uh, uh, you know, um, pursue your disputes uh, peacefully if you have any. But we've all touched on something, the disputes um, and how they affected the uh, economy. And that has been the um, pattern of Kenya, that every election year the economy stalls um, because of the insecurity. We have ethnic clashes, but we also have the business environment uh, and, and investors jittery. So um, I'll start with you, Mr. Kenneth. How would you ensure that the cycle of violence we have seen in Kenya, um, or that elections actually, let me rephrase the question, how would you ensure that elections in Kenya do not affect the economy? I think the first thing is that we have to get our security right. And I can tell you this, for the last four years and five, this economy has struggled. It's growing at its highest at 4.7 which means we can't even achieve Vision 2030. We can't create jobs. We are just about to simply stop going anywhere because the number of jobs that are being created are not enough for many young people who are coming out seeking employment. At the moment, we are only creating 35,000 35, jobs in the formal sector. We have a million Kenyans looking for jobs or coming out to look for jobs every year. Not, of course, to count that you have 5.4 million Kenyans who are not employed. Now, for me, security is very important. I think the independence of judiciary is very important so that arbitration really can be left to the institutions that are put in place. I also feel through the Constitution we have brought in some safety measures. The trigger in the last election was the swearing in. The second trigger was that we didn't think the judiciary could be able to arbitrate. Those are sorted out. I am worried about many young Kenyans who are unemployed and who could use any trigger to cause a dispute. And the only other way to do it is to depoliticize the civil service so that we know that the country can run with or without politicians. And that is why it is very, very important for us to ensure the institutions envisaged in the new constitutions are in place, empowered, and working. Short of that, we still go to the five-year cycle, which really hurts our economy. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kiapi, how would you ensure that uh, elections in Kenya don't affect uh, our economy negatively? First of all, we need to change the motive what drives leadership in Kenya. 
What drives leadership in Kenya is power and raw power, not really people empowerment. It's not leadership in the sense of leadership. What I would like to do is to make sure that we give power back to the people. That's what democracy is all about. So that's we, what the Constitution says. We, we, we empower the citizens by making sure when we go to elections, there will be no rigging because the citizens are speaking. The truth must begin there. Number two, we must make sure the institutions that manage these processes, the IEBC and the judiciary and all the institutions involved, including the security institutions, are given the tools and empowerment, but there is no manipulation. If you set an election and create a power interest and frame them almost like you frame an election to fail, then we have a problem. So I would like us to shift away from election or from leadership that is about intrigues, it's about power, it's about interest, to an election about empowering people in terms of economy, in terms of education for our children, in terms of security, in terms of the Kenya's position and in international markets. It's about Vision 2030, and, and it is leadership. Like the American president, Bill Clinton, once said, they, he looked at the American situation and he said, the economy is stupid. In Kenya, it is leadership stupid. We've got to fix the leadership. If we do it, there is no problem with Kenya. And I would personally demonstrate it if given to become president. It is this unselfish leadership that is needed. And it is Kenyans who can only do that because I can't, you know, no, none of us here can elect themselves as president. It is the, the citizens who will make up their minds. And they have to do what the prophet told us yesterday. We cannot go round and round and round. We have to break away from that and, and take bold decisions. Thank you. Mr. Kenyatta, between now and uh, 2013, we have about 17 years and therefore about three more elections. Um, but Vision 2030 asks us to attain double-digit growth. Um, how would you do that given the cycle of uh, negative growth around elections? I think the first and most important thing to recognize is that uh, we now have a new constitution. And a lot of things are very clearly stipulated in that constitution. For example, one of the biggest issues has always been around the independence or the transparency around the electoral commission we now have an independent electoral commission that has been appointed through an inclusive process that has been established we have a judiciary that has equally been um, appointed through a transparent uh, um, open uh, process there is no reason whatsoever for any leader for any political party to call for mass action going forward because we now have institutions that are transparent. I think that goes a long way. The second issue is the issue of um, using ethnic animosity um, in, uh, in, in, in elections. I think the Constitution is very clear. We have several commissions now that are in place to ensure that the issue of hate speech and such don't apply. We also have what we call now the reformed um, and public service, where people will be applying for interviews. And as uh, my colleague has said, we will now have an administration in place that can operate outside of the political uh, arena and independently and move the country along. I think strengthening and the strengthening of these institutions is going to go a long way towards ensuring that elections now become an event every five years, but not an event that destabilizes the economy. And Going forward, I do believe that um, with a peaceful election this time round, next Monday, I am confident that our investors, our business people, will be able to say that Kenya has come of age and is now able to handle their elections in a non-violent manner and for us all to accept the results as they come out and Thank the you. nation moves forward. Thank you. Mr. Odinga, how much responsibility do you accept for stalled economic growth? Because, of course, you've run for president before, um, and uh, we've had insecurity around e elections that you've particip uh, participated in. Well, as you know that uh, we have really been moving forward, getting Kenya from a banana republic to what it should be. Now, we now have developed a new constitution uh, through a very elaborate process. So by faithfully implementing the Constitution, we'll be able to create proper institutions of governance in the country that uh, will inspire confidence in this governance. And as far as electioneering is concerned, 
It actually depends on the players first, and the political parties, which need to be national, and also the way that they actually conduct themselves, so that you actually do not divide the people along ethnic lines or inside them, that nobody will come up and flaunt ethnic figures and say that this block plus this block has got this percentage, so this election has already been won. So you accept no responsibility for past insecurity? Yes. And uh, the other one is, of course, the institutions. The Electoral Commission need to be above board. And also other security agencies. Because last time we had a situation where the police themselves were very much involved in the process of interfering with elections. The provincial administration, as an institution, was used very extensively to try to blackmail people to vote al along a certain lines. So once we have come out also the transformation of the public service, then we will be able to inspire confidence, not only in our people, but in the foreigners who live here, so that investors can continue to invest even during the period of electioneering. Ms. Karua, how would you address this, given that in the last uh, week we have um, had the Chief Justice of the country claiming that his life is being threatened? Let me say that first is to invest in the social development of our people. That is why we are always talking about civic education. Our people who have information are unlikely to be manipulated. We as leaders manipulate the people to fight, yet our children are never in the front line of those fights. It's other people's children we use. So helping people to realize that violence is not an option. The other thing is respect and strengthening of our institutions. I have seen leaders who are on this podium assailing the confidence in our institutions, whether it is the security institutions and others, by their utterances. Right now on this podium, we are talking about the defunct electoral commission. Although we know that it is political parties and their agents who recruit people to rig elections, no electoral commission can be totally nonpartisan. The Kenyan one, the process we adopted in Parliament, the committee that selected the names was from the Prime Minister's office and the President's office. I can stand here and say they are partisan, but as Kenyans we have to give each other a chance. There are many checks and balances against uh, an institution rigging, and for me, I'm putting my faith and trust in them, urging my supporters to help. Let us all help to have credible institutions. The last one, justice system. We must make sure that the prosecutions, the investigations are reformed, and we must make sure perpetrators of violence are punished to deter others from following that course. Thank you. Mr. Dida? About uh, elections and economy. Actually, the question is, how do you um, stop uh, elections in Kenya from being synonymous with uh, stalled economic growth? We love money. The young, the old, all of us. And the mistake we did is we, the, there is a lot of money up there. The only solution is we bring it to normalcy. If we say the president of this country will earn 100,000, and uh, a lecturer in the university will get 120. With all these responsibilities, nobody will go. You just look at what am I supposed to do? What is the pay? And uh, you, if we agree and work on that, nobody will. I asked so many councillors, county reps, when they were coming for certificates, why do you want? Why do you want to be a county rep? And you, you can serve Kenya in a better. They were saying, we just care. Mshara need 300,000. I don't know who will say this. So the only way is we reduce that madness in payment. Let it be normal. And uh, in, the, the, in Europe and the developed country, you will see somebody with a master's just going to for, for, for a just manual shop, uh, arranging boxes in a supermarket because it be pays better. Uh, the other thing is we need to have spiritual leaders. Jesus Christ is a role model. He, 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 he is a leader who will ensure that everybody has eaten before he eats. Jesus could not be driven home with a convoy of six vehicles while it is raining on innocent Kenyans at the stage. If Jesus was a leader, he could not crown himself. The Remuneration Commission will say, we have proposed 1.75 for the president, 
and then you, are, you, are, you, are want, you want to be the president, then you laugh. Hey, yeah, it's good, it's good. No! You refuse. Where will this money come from? This money will be collected from the ordinary Kenyans who have problems with the rent, with the transport, with all these things. With, yeah. So we need, we need to, to reduce that madness. Number two, we also want to have leaders who mind, serve humanity. Mr. Mudavadi, how would you address uh, stalled economic growth whenever we have elections in Kenya? Well, elections must always be seen as an event, and now it's guaranteed and the date is very clear within our constitution. So we should not have any more doubts around that. But I think, let's face the reality. What may be happening about slowing down of economic growth is not unique to Kenya. This does happen even in the developed uh, economies. Once in a while when there's a cycle of election, uh, because there's the question of who is going to be there, what policies are they going to stand for, what policies are they going to bring out, this definitely creates some measure of concern and reservation within investors, and sometimes they hold back. Now, as we move forward, I think we will need to strengthen a few things. One, our political parties will have to be strengthened so that they become more uh, policy-oriented rather than dealing with either tribal orientation or personality cults. This is one thing that needs to come out very, very clearly. The other thing that uh, we would need to work on is to complete the legislation around elections. We have not done that. We have not completed the campaign uh, funding uh, legislation. Now, this brings in another issue because the question is people get worried and say what is going to happen within this government system if there's no, there are no checks and balances. Are they going to loosen their guard and mess up with the economy? And all these are issues that come up when one is getting towards an election. But I can tell you, we have started the right process. We then have to follow the law strictly. We have to be disciplined uh, ourselves as politicians. Uh, the electorate must also be disciplined uh, and be able to know that it's a process where they determine their leadership. And after they've determined their leadership, they are supposed to go on with their work. But clearly, if Kenya or any other country was about to elect uh, an Idi Amin or somebody like that, the reality would be that there would be uncertainty in the eyes of the investors. So there's need for scrutiny of all candidates as we move along. Your time is up. Mr. Mwite? I believe that the slowdown stems from uncertainties. Businesses, investors feel uncertain. Is there going to be violence? What is going to happen? Uncertainties. And if elections are free and fair and seem to be free and fair, if elections are fought on the basis of issues, economic issues, interest rates, things like those ones, I believe those uncertainties will be a thing of the past. Ultimately, apart from elections being free and fair, we need to address the core issues which give rise to it, the root causes which are the poverty levels, ethnic mobilization, the land issue. When these are addressed and solutions found, then elections will just be an event and investors will not need to harbor any uncertainties. But there is a lot to celebrate in Kenya. We've come a long way. I like the way that people have been sensitized about there not being any need to lose any Kenyan life I believe there is not going to be any violence. Any person who is going to lose the elections will go to the courts. But the earlier signs should be addressed. For example, there are still people who moved in other people's houses, people from a particular community, moved into houses built by members of another community. 